Hello and welcome to VITA's online live educational event, Ask the Experts. This is the patient edition of our Ask the Experts, and this very special event includes a panel of distinguished vestibular medical professionals that volunteer on VITA's Medical Advisory Board and Board of Directors. This is a very unique opportunity for patients and caregivers to engage with these individuals. And I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Strauss. I'm a vestibular physical therapist, past president of the VITA Board, and a member of the Medical Advisory Board as well. Today we have joining us Dr. Stephen Rausch, Richard Clendaniel, and Michael Schubert, and we're probably going to be joined by some additional um, physicians and uh, healthcare providers who are currently trying to join us. So we're going to welcome people as they come in and welcome to all of you. Um, let's see, I see, I'm going to pause if I see somebody who I need to bring in. In the background behind me, assisting me today is Dr. Daniel Tolman. She's our regular co-host on our live events and I welcome and appreciate her being behind the scenes today. Today we have a series of questions that have been submitted from um, our, our audience members and they just relate to a variety of topics, including diagnosis of vestibular disorders, treatments, and a look into what might be on the horizon for some of those uh, challenging conditions. Um, so welcome everyone to the board and to, to the panel. Thank you very much. As we go through today, you're welcome to, and you're invited to submit comments. Tell us where you're from. We have a very international uh, audience today, which is always a thrill. We're excited that we reach all uh, corners of the globe and um, we invite you to ask your questions specific to them. We do have present physicians and uh, rehab professionals alike and scientists involved in research. So um, with that being said, let me begin with talking about vestibular disorders and VITA has been around for 30 years. And back then patients would see an average of more than five doctors before arriving at a diagnosis. Do we think that the journey towards a diagnosis is still longer in vestibular health than it used to be? And if so, why? How about um, we begin that with Dr. Rausch? Would you like to address that? I'm not hearing you. He's muted. He's muted? Oh, okay, one second. Now try. Oh. oh. Hi, we got you. Now. Yeah, thanks for having me today. You bet. Uh, you know, in our Western medical or healthcare uh, tradition, we we chop up the body by organ system. Now we have, uh, and and we chop it up even more by medical and surgical counterparts. We have cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. We have pulmonologists and thoracic surgeons, rheumatologists and orthopedic surgeons. The problem is that balance has no respect for the boundaries of medical specialties. It's a distributed system all through us. Uh, it's, it's ears, it's eyes, it's muscles and joints, it's brains, uh, both the, uh, you know, sort of the neurological side and the psychiatric side, so that uh, there's no one specialist who owns the whole system. And our patients rattle around, uh, bouncing from specialist to specialist. It's a story that we encountered uh, with patients uh, who had sleep disorders 40 years ago, 30 years ago, but sleep uh, gradually became its own specialty. And uh, now patients can get a somewhat more streamlined service, but it hasn't happened yet for the dizzy patient. So what you're saying is that it's true and maybe it's still necessary for a vestibular patient to see a variety of physicians and specialists? Or do you think that if there was a balance specialist, that that would cover all those things? Hard Don't to know. say. I think, yeah. I, I think that um, it, uh, there are tricks to streamlining the, the journey, uh, uh, probably at, at entry into the, into the whole process. Um, if we could agree upon some language, I think if we could you know, the patients and the providers could agree to lose the word dizzy. Uh, that would be a great start. I think that uh, the first fork in the road for me when I interview a patient is whether or not their problem affects their balance. 
And I can't tell you how many people have been complaining of dizziness for five and 10 and 20 years. And they've been to countless docs and they've had innumerable prescriptions for meclizine. And nobody ever asked if it was a balance problem or not. Um, I, I really think that uh, most of us who are involved with Vita, we're, we're really balanced doctors. Uh, or not doctors exclusively, but you know what I mean, balanced providers. And uh, if, we, if we could quickly jump to that arena, we would, we'd make a giant dent in uh, moving the patient forward. We're going to talk about a multidisciplinary team in the next question, but I want to give the other guests on a chance to chime in on that, because I think that that is why this particular population continues over the decades, actually, now being a little frustrated with where do I fit in? Where do I go? Where do I start? Where do I end? So any comments to to that, Dr. Kun Daniel or Schubert? I think in some, in some senses it's improving, um, just speaking from the terms of our personal practice, we get referrals from internal medicine physicians who, where the patient goes, they're dizzy, they rule out the medical issues for the most part, and then they send them on to us for treatment or evaluation and treatment. So I think in some respects it's speeding up a little bit in that there are probably more avenues to get into seeing um, medical folks who are interested in treating dizziness and balance disorders. But at the same time, I see folks who have been dealing with this for a number of years and as, as Dr. Rash said, I've seen numerous physicians, um, healthcare providers before they actually get an accurate diagnosis and appropriate treatment started. Yeah, I would only add that um, I, I, I'm not sure we're that actually much better as far as how many providers a person sees, but there are regional differences also. So if you're in the Northeast versus the South, there's there's some regional differences for time to get in to be seen uh, that, 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 you know, needs to be sort of healthcare disparity issues. And then the other thing I would say is that you do need multiple providers, particularly for the complicated patient. I mean, it's rare that I think, at least from in my practice, I rarely see posterior canal, benign paroxysmal, positional vertigo, and that's it. It's a complicated sort of presentation that might include some positional vertigo and often includes a referral to see a physician for medical management and or some other professional. So I don't think there's one person. I think that 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 is a little unique in that rehab for balance and dizziness symptoms is a multidisciplinary sort of care, I think is probably the best way to approach it. Seems like there's an international conversation about moving towards a vestibular medicine specialist. And in this country, we're still quite divided and the multidisciplinary team seems to be the thing that most uh, in the US agree is the gold standard. Would, would you agree with that? Can someone take the answer? Uh, what is a multidisciplinary team and who should be on it for the complete care of the vestibular patient? Dr. Quinn Daniel, you want to start? <laughs> Well, I well maybe you don't want to. I can't. I can't hear you very well. You're scratching on your microphone. Fuzzy on your microphone. So, Dr. Schubert. So, well, I I think so. You need neur neurotology. Uh, you need uh rehab medicine, and and uh and neurology. I, I think are the, the three primary providers that you need. So you have rehab and then physician providers uh, to, to round that team out. Um, a, a less less common to have psychiatry, but that that's a that also um, plays a role sometime as well. Um, and I think that the uh, you know using allied health nurse practitioners and and rehab providers as the as potentially the, the first provider of care can work, but only in a multidisciplinary framework. I think so that that's a way to get maybe people in sooner. Uh, there are more rehab providers than there are physician providers that see these patients, frankly. And there's plenty of patients 
Um, but they have to have multi-D access, I think, or access to provide to physician providers for that to work well. You're muted, Kathleen. Thank you. Dr. Neil Shepard is joining us. He's probably getting his audio set up as I play with mine. He's on the screen. Dr. Shepard, we see you and we welcome you to the panel as soon as you can come on and hear us. We're talking about multidisciplinary, what it is in the US and how that may differ in other parts of the country. I think that's an interesting comment that we need to find out who is the first uh, line of um, exposure to the patient to sort of triage the patient. And I know with Vito, we've been working with a variety of institutions around the country to develop triage protocols, whether a patient enters the system through the emergency department, through a therapist's office, through a general practitioner's office, that that idea of triage, which means where do we go from here, sort of what is the need, maybe what is the system involved, what is the first thing we need to do to that patient, that's part of where we're still developing. And, and I find when we talk to the audience that we have at Vita, which is a global audience, we are um, reminding people that, believe it or not, <laughs> we're still developing the best methods of triage protocols and establishing those and educating the variety of practitioners across the healthcare spectrum on what they are. And I think that that comes as a surprise to people with vestibular problems because I think they assume that we're much farther along than we are. Does anyone agree with that? That, you know, I think that they assume we know more than we know or that we're farther along than we are and that the, you, the world is still working together very hard to communicate with all emergency departments, all primary care physicians on how to properly manage them. So Dr. Rizik, can you hear me? Welcome to the panel. I can hear you. Sorry for I, being late. That's okay. I was thinking that you would want to chime in on this idea of multidisciplinary approach to the vestibular patient, being that you are uh, involved with one at your institution in South Carolina. Um, we were talking about what that means to the vestibular patient and who should be on it. Um, and can you tell us what it would be like, what you think a gold standard multidisciplinary balance program, vestibular program would look like in a university setting? Who has access to it and, and why is that important? Sure, I mean, the ideal setting would include uh, an ENT, a neurologist, a physical therapist, an audiologist with quick access to uh, a neuroophthalmologist or a psychiatrist for support services not necessarily immediately available, or an internal medicine doctor to rule out, uh, you know, medical causes of dizziness. But the reality is that this is very hard to achieve. But most of us work in teams, you know, in our, in our department, um, I run the dizziness clinic with the support of the vestibular therapists and the vestibular audiologist and close collaboration with neurology. In other uh, centers, it's the neurologist who takes over and and builds up the team around them but basically the the tripod is a neurotologist or a neurologist with physical therapy and audiology that's my opinion and that's the gold standard i wonder if we knew what percent of vestibular patients um actually get access to a multidisciplinary team approach um throwing it out there just to wonder like do we think it's 10%, 20%, 50%. I imagine we see people on the chat today that are going to say, no, we just don't have access to that. Um, it, but it's certainly something we're looking at is access. Do we find that there's a real role for telehealth in maybe uh, giving patients an opportunity to have a multidisciplinary approach for vestibular problems? Anyone? I mean, telehealth is, I mean, it's a, it's definitely uh, helpful for because dizzy patients have also difficulty for access to health care. In addition to the actual health disparities that exist across the U.S., it would be more valuable from a follow up standpoint or if legislator in specific states allows physical therapists to conduct some of their vestibular rehab sessions remotely, which is not available everywhere. But I think for a good assessment a new patient needs to be seen in person. But yes, telehealth can expand access, especially to the rehab services. Mm -hmm. 
A lot of people live in PT deserts. Dr. Shepard, are you trying to, okay. Dr. Shepard and then Dr. Rouse. Oh, I can't hear you. Let's see. Um, I can't hear you, Dr. Shepard. I don't see you on mute, but I can't hear you. Oh, I can't hear you. Okay, Dr. Rouse. So uh, I think um, it's important to make clear that uh, if we're going to provide care to everybody who comes in with a balance problem, we need to have lots of different types of expertise, but not every patient needs to see every member of the team. Uh, that's a terribly wasteful uh, use of limited resources when you figure how few docs specialize in this kind of problem and how many patients need services. Um, so that uh, I, I wouldn't want your, I wouldn't want the audience today to come away with the notion that they have to be seen by a multidisciplinary team. A lot of dizzy patients have very straightforward problems and uh, they get it taken care of and it's once and done, uh, or at least they may get to a, a diagnosis soon. But you know, um, even that notion that you have to get the diagnosis so you can move on to treatment is a little bit wrong-headed in my opinion. I think that uh, for every visit, I try to have a conversation with patients about uh, today, what, how, how do we define success? And it might be shortening the list of diagnostic possibilities. It might be scheduling a test. It might be deciding which specialist they see next. But as long as they're moving forward toward better health, that's a success. If the only measure of success is curing my vertigo, I don't clear that mm. bar very often. That's very, very important what you said. And I had, when I was, we were looking at questions and how to guide this discussion, um, one of the things was, you know, an accurate diagnosis is optimal for identifying the best treatment. And that if we're treating something and we have the wrong diagnosis, obviously we won't be successful. Every ailment has that, that the efficacy of the treatment depends on the accuracy of the diagnosis. But this is particularly challenging in the vestibular patient. Do you think the vestibular, uh, that, that path of taking steps forward and entertaining the things that we call differential diagnoses or diagnostic possibilities, is that unique to vestibular disorders, different than maybe what's the cause of someone's stomach ache or what's the cause of you know, their, their headache? Or is this the way medicine is in general? Well, I, I don't think I need an accurate diagnosis to treat the patient. Uh, I, I don't see it as a linear diagnose, then treat. Um, you know, the, the reality is that for, with few exceptions, everybody who comes to see me with a balance problem ends up going to physical therapy. And I don't need their diagnosis to send them to physical therapy. The, the physical therapist is going to do an assessment of the patient's functional capacity in various domains, and they're going to tailor a treatment to improve the patient's function and quality of life. And it doesn't matter what I call the disorder. So that uh, I, I really think sometimes it's a big distraction to get hung up on naming the condition. Um, we can, we can treat the patient without the name of the condition. That's not for everything, but, I, but actually I think for a, a huge proportion of dizzy patients, I don't need a definitive diagnosis. Any comments to that? Because to me, that's, that's sort of a breath, breath of fresh air to hear because in the rehab arena that I'm at, I, I agree with that. And I think it's important for our audience to hear that because sometimes they think they have multiple diagnoses ongoing at the same time when in fact it's possible and or do you think it's possible uh, that they in fact have to see multiple providers who's given it their best shot and they don't really have vestibular disorder a b and c and d and this um, is it that we are unclear in the diagnosis or that there's these comorbidities let's go to neil can we hear you let me see I can't hear Dr. Shepard yet. Okay, um, who's next? Who would like to go? Dr. Schubert, do you wanna talk about comorbidities and whether or not people, these things always run together in vestibular problems or is it just collecting multiple diagnoses from multiple healthcare providers? Anyone yeah, you know, I, 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 I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, in the rehab world, 
you know, we're treating a function or we're treating a symptom. We, we prescribe exercises based on a functional reason, a functional limitation or a symptom. Now we need to do the exam and it's not to, to, to take that away, but, but that's what, that's what we do. And that's what gets patients better. There is a responsibility and the rehab provider, I think is the, is the, is the right person because we see these patients more often. We tend to see the same person repeatedly whereas a physician provider might not see them as often. So I think there is an onus on the rehab provider to have to sit down and have this honest conversation about what, what are their goals? What, why, why does someone come to see me when I think they think they're going to come and see me and they think that I'm going to do something different. And I, and I query them in the medical history and they've done the best already that rehab currently can. Maybe, right. maybe some of you have had that experience too. And, and it's that they need a different path. They need to, they need to, and, and the rehab provider needs to sit down and kind of have that difficult talk with them. And maybe there's medication and maybe there's psychology as Habib mentioned, and maybe there's these other issues, but that also is the, I think is the responsibility on our end as rehab providers is to cut through and see, you know, rehab's only going to be able to do so much. We got to be realistic about what rehab can provide, and what's the other part of the of the treatment that they need. And it, and it's not diagnostic driven. That's really driven by what their symptom manifestation and what their functional limitations are. So one of we had a, a question from um, the audience that says is. Is Ehlers-Danlos syndrome linked with Meniere's disease? And are there diagnoses that include both vestibular dysfunction and motor control issues? Uh, are there certain comorbidities or things that exist together? And this particular question was about Meniere's, but um, who would like to take that? Comorbidities and vestibular Rouch. disorders. Go ahead, Dr. Rush. So yeah. I'm not aware of any link of Meniere's syndrome with with uh, EDS, uh, I, I've not ever heard of that as an association. But you know, we see lots of patients who have more than one problem, and they may have migraine, and they may have cerebellar degeneration, and they may have spinal stenosis, and they may have post-concussion syndrome. And you know, having one of those doesn't protect you from getting the others. It, it, it's just that if we look at the whole spectrum, at least for, you know, I'm an ear doc. If we look at the spectrum of ear disorders that um, might darken my door, you know, might cross into my clinic, I can divide them into episodic and persistent. Uh, I can divide them into dangerous and not dangerous. I can divide them into temporary or lasting a long time and how I might move forward with the patient is going to depend on the patient's priorities. You know, if their highest priority is that, uh, you know, six weeks from now, they have to walk their daughter down the aisle at her wedding. That's a different uh, rehab uh, challenge than somebody who has progressive disequilibrium of aging and they just want to stay in their own home and not have to, you know, go into into a rehab, you know, chronic long-term care facility. It's, it's not driven by the specifics. It's not exclusively driven by the specifics of a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And maybe to the question of, um, is there a link? I think the links that have been discussed um, are in the realm of, for example, the people with vestibular migraine. Um, may have a higher likelihood of having what BPPV or, you know, um, there are some correlations. We are correlating some things with, with, each, with each other. But with regards to loss of motor control, um, would you agree that when a person has dizziness and a loss of motor control, we try to rule out a central problem, like you mentioned, a cerebellar problem or a problem in the central nervous system that be, may be impacting their motor control? Um, as well. So it's certainly a, something to be concerned about. And, and sometimes it could be the, the brain impacting the movement disorder, or it could be another separate problem.
peripheral neurological problem or musculoskeletal problem. Any other comorbidities? I know, Dr. Rizik, with you, we talked about comorbidities and um, vestibular migraines and so forth. What, what are your comments and observations about new research finding that things are going together or what increases someone's risk? Dr. Rob, you wanted to say something? I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I do not want to uh, hog the, the microphone, okay. but I, I want to make one, one comment here. Um, there are, in all of medicine, not just for, for our field, but in all of medicine, there are only two reasons to assign a specific diagnosis to the patient, to seek to, to assign a specific diagnosis. One is if it guides our treatment, and the other is if it allows us to prognosticate, to predict the future. And those are the only two reasons that we have to give you uh, the name. And, and one of the things that, that many of us run into is a patient who's been given a label and ever after the label, the, people keep treating the label instead of treating the patient. And, and especially in balance disorders where it, there are so many contributing factors, I really think we do our patient a disservice by rushing to hang a label on them or for them to clutch the label uh, and, and, and sort of hold that in front of them. Um, I'd much rather treat the patient than the label. Thank you very much for that. We appreciate it. Dr. Rizek, you were going to say. I mean, the current uh, known associations are what you just cited, Meniere's disease with migraine disorders, Meniere's disease and BPPV. Vitamin D deficiency seems to have some effect in correlation to benign positional vertigo. Um, the problem with finding more association is also, like Dr. Rauch said, about the, the current diagnostic criteria that are available, not all the patients will fit into it. And yet I would treat a patient with this for a vestibular migraine, even though they don't check all the boxes for a vestibular migraine. So there's a lot of work about expanding our current criteria and about feeling comfortable in treating the current gray areas. Um, and as, as long as we have those patients who fall on the margin of the current labels, we will not be able to find much more associations or you know dig deep into it but again do we need to actually do we need to find all of those associations to treat the patient probably not one major uh, contender for one of the biggest uh, comorbidity with vestibular problem is headaches and migraine disorders that's unmistakable and yet i find myself trying to convince patients of such a thing on a daily basis um so i guess before the, the more urgent uh, or the more pressing uh, thing that as a community we should be doing is addressing the educational component, uh, educating the, the medical community and the patient more about how migraine disorders can interact. Because this is a very frequent problem and often still misunderstood. Thank you can for you, that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Dr. Shepard, welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Were you and, able to hear us that you'd like to? Oh, yeah, now? I could hear you all. Okay, great. Control. Yeah, Let's and I certainly, certainly agree with uh, uh, Habib and uh, Steve in terms of their comments uh, about it. One thing that that is difficult to impress upon patients is that there may be an association or a correlation between one disorder they have and another disorder, but that that's not a cause and effect relationship. And so it shouldn't be interpreted that way. The, and I agree with the fact that, the, yes, there are lots of them that can show up. You have migraine with, as Habib said, lots of different things. And as Steve said, you don't need an accurate diagnosis to treat the patient. You can treat patients, and that treatment really works toward their functional disabilities, what things are causing them problems that they can't do, what they would like to do. Those can be dealt with um, other than surgical issues, but those can be dealt with without a uh, strict uh, diagnostic uh, entity that they've been handed. 
And the last thing is that, uh, yeah, there's lots of patients that come in to see us that um, have been given a diagnosis. And that diagnosis may be correct for what happened at the very beginning. But by the time we get them, their symptoms have changed. And in many cases, they have morphed into another disorder, uh, the most likely of which is 3PD, yeah. where things have gone on for a while and they aren't getting any better. So you have to look not at what has been said is happening to them, but what's happening to them now based on their symptoms and um, the functional disabilities that they're having. That's a great comment, and that leads into another question that somebody had, which says, when diagnosed with multiple disorders, is it best to treat them all at once or one at a time? And so I hear some of you saying, well, the patient's quality of life, their functional impairments should drive or prioritize what you treat, or is there another algorithm? Do we do things one at a time in top down, or are we looking at what's most important to the patient or causing them the most functional disability? Dr. Quinn Daniel, we haven't heard from you. Let's see if we can get you on good audio. You wanna chime in on that one? Unmute. Mm -hmm. And does this sound better? Yeah, okay. go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right, this is the third microphone I've tried, so. Okay. Um, I think, I, I guess I have two answers to that. Um, one is what's most important to the patient, address that first, you know, what's their biggest problem. Um, the other answer is go for the low hanging fruit. So if it's a case of BDPV plus unilateral vestibular loss or imbalance, I would treat the BDPV first. That's gonna be the, likely the easiest thing to treat and then see what you're dealing with, with that after that. Um, but yeah, I think the overall, my overall approach is what's most problematic for the patient? What are they really trying to get back to doing? Um, again, looking at as, as everybody said, looking at their function and trying to improve their function. Great. When we talk about um, prognosis, there's one question in particular that came up and has come up time and time again. Do we have any updates on long-term predictions for those with bilateral vestibular involvement, whether it be bilateral vestibular hypofunction or total loss? Um, any comments on that? I know I, in my clinic, and, and he, hear a lot of people ask even about research advances in technology to maybe have a prosthetic or uh, substitute vestibular apparatus. Um, where can, what, can we, what can we be encouraged about for the treatment of bilateral vestibular patients? Um, I'll let Michael address the, the prosthesis since he's at Hopkins where that's being developed uh, or sure. one of being developed. Okay. But I think in, mm -hmm. but in, in terms of rehab, um, yeah, certainly bilateral issues are harder to treat. They typically take longer to kind of reach their maximum level of recovery. Like some studies have suggested up to maybe two years. But I think part of that is also dependent on how much remaining function they have and how well they can tap, how well the patient's able to tap into any remaining vestibular cues or vestibular inputs that may be, that may remain. But they, they are challenging, but Michael, why don't you address the prosthesis if you want. Tell us what a vestibular prosthesis would be, what we're looking at, what seems to be working and what's not and which directions we're well, going. Well, yeah, I, I can sort of speak, you know, next to what's going on. I'm not directly on that project, of course. That might be a special topic of interest that Vita might like to hold and have some of those folks that are in that vestibular prosthetic world. It is very encouraging. There are, um, there, there's nothing available through FDA approval yet. It's only clinical trials, early sort of phase trials. There, uh, the versions are different. Hopkins has a, what uh, Charlie calls a multi uh, channel vestibular prosthesis. So it does uh, in a, a three electrode array. Actually, it's multiple electrodes, but it goes to each ancillary nerve of the semicircular canals. Uh, and then they wear a rate sensor basically on the external part of the head that detects the direction of the head rotation, generates a signal that stimulates that nerve. 
Uh, I've seen the patients sort of pre and post. It is impressive. Charlie has some great videos if you've seen any of his uh, presentations. And I think it is going to be a great advance. They still need rehab. They still need to learn how to use it. Uh, what they the subjects tend to report is balance is improved. In fact, so many of the uh, subjects had improved balance that Charlie was able to get FDA approval for them to continue to use the device. The device as designed via the FDA's input was sort of does it work, and then we're going to take it away, and you know it's um, not be able to use it. But they got sort of a compassionate clause approval to continue because they felt like it was so helpful. Um, so that's the prosthetic. And then there's, you know, there's some other labs that are, that are working on, on that too. And they're at different stages. From a rehab standpoint, as Rick said, it's harder. We do VOR gain training. We've studied it in bilateral vestibular hypofunction. The gain is modifiable if they have some residual function. Remember, a lot of people with bilateral vestibular hypofunction have Bilateral reduction, but it's asymmetric. It might be worse on one side and then a, a little bit of preservation on the other side. We published this so we can drive that gain up some and we believe that can be helpful. But their, their morbidity, of course, is much worse and they uh, don't do quite as well. But they, the, the current rehab, as Susan Herbman has published some of this work and some others, showing that they can make improvements. It's just limited and it looks like it takes a little bit longer. And I think if we can improve our rehab and know better how to treat vestibular hypofunction, then, then there's no reason to think a person with bilateral hypofunction won't be able to make some improvement. But it will be, but the expectations are they won't be as good as some of you. Mm -hmm. Go I ahead. think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really important uh, for the bilaterals, but you know, for all our patients, any, anybody who who gets ill, again, not just vestibular, not just balance, but, you know, any of us, we all have a, a vision of the trajectory of our lives going forward. You know, we have an expectation. And when we get sick, we fall off the rails. And, and the patient comes to the provider to put them back on the rails, to put them exactly back on the, the path they were on and follow it into the future as they expected. And, and in med school and, and where you all trained, I'm sure you were, you were taught to, to try to do that. But the reality is that we usually don't. We don't put someone exactly back on the trajectory where they came from. And so um, if the patient sees that path, but they're heading off this way, it brings up all kinds of stress and sadness and anger and grief and every negative emotion you can think of. And so we all do what we can to nudge them back toward the original path. But but we also need to take uh, make some effort to help them reimagine their their trajectory, their path forward. You know, you know on your on your the GPS thing in your car when you make a wrong yeah. turn and it starts saying recalculating route recalculating route. Yes. I really think all of us need to help the patient recalculate the route. They can still be happy. They can still be productive. They can have joy in their lives, oh. but it's a different trip. That's such a great reminder. And at Vita, we do a lot of talking with people about finding their new normal. And I think that while, you know, it might not be normal or they're optimal, um, their new steady state or their new reality is something that takes some adjustment. And I think that's the place that as rehab professionals or, or medical professionals, we're looking at helping them find that new steady state, finding contentment where they are. Those with, uh, The next question talks about the treatment of triple PD or PPPD. Those are the patients who seem to be, um, it was mentioned earlier in the talk that maybe there are their illness begins with a defined vestibular problem that is understood, but then leads to a chronic uh, level of suffering and struggling. Um, and I think that those people who struggle the, the most with these long-term chronic illnesses are a large part of the VIA population. That's just my experience, that a lot of the people who are maybe watching today are experiencing the, the triple PD do we need to do more in that area? Is what we're doing working? And 
who would like to comment about that? It seems to be that we are using a mixture of medications or a multimodal approach to the treatment of triple PD. Um, what's new in the research? Where are we going with that? And what can we say to those people watching with triple PD? I would say our best, the best way to tackle 3PD is to be able to get the patient sooner before they present it. I mean, two thirds of those patients present to us with a year of symptoms. They went physician shopping, they went physical therapy to various places. They've been treated for BPPV for over a year and they don't have that. I, I guess the, the best breakthrough we can make with 3PD is improve the management of patients with vestibular disorders from the get from the get go. We just uh, did a review of our healthcare access into our center in the state of South Carolina, and it is kind of appalling how little access those patients get. A lot of patients from from the state get to to be seen. You know, maybe they don't need all of them need multidisciplinary teams, but they need somebody who is able to drive the treatment forward. And if they end up going to chiropractors or non-vestibular therapists, that delays getting there. So to talk about 3PD in particular, that is the usual treatment plan currently. A trial of medications, none of them are superior to the others. There's no gold standard. But I find with my patients physical therapy and learning coping strategies to reimagine their life, like Dr. Rauch was saying, is helpful. And a lot of patients regain control and they can come back to a productive life, even if they have, you know, symptoms lurking behind still. But they are able to manage them better. I, I'm, I'm worried that, that uh, we might not all agree on the definition of 3PD. Um, it, I, you know, in the, the original conception of it, both, you, you know, from overseas and from the work that Jeff Staub and Mike Ruckenstein did years ago, it's patients who do not have another identifiable balance problem, or at least by the time they're coming to see us, everything's normal, but they feel like they're rocking on the deck of a ship. And when they sit down and get tactile, feedback that they're still, their symptoms go away, and when they get up on their feet, they feel like they're on the deck of a ship. Um, it's not just people who had a vestibular illness and never quite compensated. It, it, uh, so it's, it shouldn't be a wastebasket for everybody who feels like they have crummy balance. It, it's very specifically people who, ha who are normal on the million dollar workup and have a pure anxiety disorder. Uh, hypervigilance about their balance. Um, I think those are pretty different things. You know, I think somebody who's got a pure psychological hypervigilance problem is different from someone with incomplete vestibular compensation who feels crummy. That's a good point. And I think there's some, oh, go ahead, Neil, go ahead. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the criteria that the Barony put out with their international classification of vestibular disorders is very specific, like you're saying. And the, the right on the top, 3PD is not a um, disorder that is a psychiatric disorder. It doesn't fit in the uh, DSM-5 categories at all. That's been reviewed, looked at, and published. Uh, the idea is that they have like you said, they typically fit a profile of, they go from a worry ward and then morph into a true anxiety disorder possibly later on, but they don't have to have that in order to have this disorder. But they have the symptoms of a rocking sensation or something else that occurs probably, if you think about it over time, better than 50% of the time. And it, uh, it can be stimulated by a variety of different things, but one of the keys is that it is stimulated by visual activity, either visual complexity, visual motion, um, visual activity such as reading. Doing a lot of things of that type will make their symptoms worse or bring them on. And so, yes, it, they, we, 
need to better educate the people out there that are seeing these patients so that as unfortunately as people hear about 3PD, then all of a sudden it becomes a place where, oh, this person's not getting any better, so that's where they'll be. And so it's like what we used to have with uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Everybody has it, okay. So, but the idea behind uh, educating others about what really are the specific diagnostic criteria, um, I think becomes important with this. And one of the things that has come out of the research over time is that at least the two main treatment options for this, if there's not a comorbidity that we're having to deal with at the same time, one is medication, and typically those are SNRIs or SSRIs and physical therapy. But specifically for physical therapy, it's habituation therapy, not the VOR therapy. That's a waste of time for someone with 3PD. And so those two have come forth as being uh, responsible for a great deal of the improvement in those patients. Very well said. It's interesting. We started out talking about the possible, uh, the, the less, uh, less importance of diagnosis. And now as we get into the diagnosis and this conversation, you see that a lot of people, uh, people have opinions on how it is and how it managed and what it is. And I think there's a lot of overlap in what you're saying now. The audience might be hearing you talk about a feeling of rocking motion and motion sensitivity and go, wait, but that's uh, mal de debarkment instead. So even differentiating between those and in treatment, um, would you agree that the rehabilitation involving habituation and eye exercises and balance exercises, depending on the patient's functional presentation to the clinic, um, is what's important? What, what are the functional deficits the patient has and treat those and not, and not worry so much about, again, what label are we putting on them? MDDS or 3PD or vestibular migraine, but, but what do they need, they need to do? Is that, is that what we're hearing? Can I, can I just add that, I mean, that's, Kathleen, the rehab, but, but the, the rehab provider needs to recognize when to stop and when that the rehab may not be working. That's the challenge, mm -hmm. right? Because the best outcomes in 3PD typically are medication plus. It's that it's sort of that intersection between they need some medical management and they also need some movement, rehab, habituation, maybe it's cognitive behavioral therapy strategy where they recognize, oh, I'm not really spinning, right. I'm not really swaying, I feel like mm -hmm. it's stop, refocus, you know, that kind of right. stuff. And and the, and the therapists need to know that. So the therapists yes. need to know what these diagnosis, cr diagnostic criteria are, as Neil said as well, because again, the PTs and the OTs are the ones that are going to see these people enough times to be able to put it together that you are not responding like you should be Correct. to these exercises. We need help. And they need to be able to have that conversation, that candid conversation that we need to reach out to your GP. We need to yeah. reach out to neuro, you know, uh, ENT, et cetera, and, and, and get some medical management. So I really yeah. love what you're saying there. I really like that because I think that's important. So a lot of people say, well, I must need to do these exercises more and longer and I'm not, com maybe I'm not right. complying or doing them right. But you're saying circling back and then for the rehab uh, patients and I'm asking for um, the rehab professionals and I'm asking the patients to also think if something's not working and you're not moving forth, go back yeah. and look at it again because adding something like you're mentioning cognitive behavioral therapy or medication um, for these things can be the answer. So I thank you for bringing that up, that, that rehab longer and more and faster and harder is, is not. Rehab not is usually it. pretty quick, right? Rehab usually, if it's going to work, it tends to be relatively fast or you see a trajectory. You see the patients getting better. Mm -hmm. Rehab providers yeah. encourage, the patients encourage, the rehab provider now right. makes things harder, progresses the exercise, et cetera treats the multiple thing like rick said we got bpd we got uvh we get rid of the bpd now we're doing gay mm -hmm. shit whatever but the, you expect them to be making progress when they come yeah. back at, at those and when that's when the, they they need to take a check and, and figure out and, and pivot 
I really like that. I think that is informative for the audience to hear that with uh, vestibular rehab used to be, it seems like I had physicians that would say, you're going to get worse before you're going to get better. I really think that patients should know pretty much on a regular basis that they're moving in the right direction, uh, that, that, it, that you should feel that. You should feel encouraged by the treatment if you're on it, if, if you're going in the right direction. Well, People are asking true. about, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think that's true for lots of treatments, not just for the rehab stuff. You know, if we're, if we think a patient might have a vestibular migraine and we treat it with medication and it improves that, uh, you know, that validates our, you know, the diagnosis we picked. And uh, on the other hand, if we are treating migraine and treating migraine and treating migraine and seeing no benefit, maybe it's not migraine, you know, the, the, the response to treatment is one of the confirmatory things that we all look for when we treat. That's a nice segue into this next question, which has to do with supplements uh, and medication, vitamins, for example, for some of these vestibular disorders. Uh, we have a question um, from someone, the comment says, I've read that vitamin D and magnesium can help with CPPV. Is there any scientific proof to support this? What, and if so, what dose of both and what type of magnesium? So do we know what the literature is saying about supplementation for BPPV and is that something that can help? The literature says that there is a correlation between vitamin D deficiency and BPPV. There's nothing in the literature that says, or there's no clear data that tells us what is the supplementation, what is the ideal level. In clinical practice, however, Personally, I test for vitamin D deficiency in a BPPV patient and tell them there has been data that says that it could be associated with recurrence. And if they are deficient, I supplement them to get them to, a, to an adequate level. But again, the, sometimes when you're looking at the scientific literature, a correlation of deficiency it does not mean there's a causality or a treatment necessarily. Yes. Um, you know, I'm amazed that the hour is almost up and there are other questions that people have submitted that we won't have time to go into today, but I, with tremendous gratitude, want to thank the panel for coming in today and give you guys each an opportunity to give your one piece of advice that you want the vestibular patient population out there listening to hear. Um, so if we could go around and I give each of you an opportunity to chime in, say what you want to say to this worldwide global audience to encourage them. You know, the Vestibular Disorders Association exists to provide help, support, and encouragement to all those people who suffer from dizziness and balance disorders related to the vestibular system and um, its related systems. We appreciate this very expert and esteemed panel for coming and together today. It shows how important you, the audience out there, is to VITA and to those providers caring for you. We appreciate your uh, participation with submitting your questions and we look forward to doing this again. And um, as we sign off with a round of final thoughts, let's begin with Dr. Yu, Dr. Rauch and um, go around and give your final thoughts. Uh, I think that the more Precisely, the more clearly my patients can describe their symptoms, the faster we can dig in to make progress and lose the word dizzy. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Dr. Schubert. I would say stay active, move. Move more. Move more. Dr. Rizik. Uh-oh. I would say uh, connect with peers, connect with support groups like Vida to understand that, you know, what is the what is the current science and that is being done and inform yourself more about your symptoms and what can be done. Take take the health in your own hands. Be your own advocate. Thank Be you. Own. Dr. Shepard, final thoughts and words. The whole idea of a team approach is very important, but you don't, as Steve said earlier, you don't have to see everybody on the team, but the team needs to participate in who you see. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that very much. And Dr. Quinn Daniel. 
It's kind of it's tough to come up with anything after those comments. Um, <laughs> so you say ditto. Yeah, I could say ditto. I, I would um, I would reiterate the point that Michael and Steve made that you know, if the treatment's being effective, you should see changes relatively quickly. And if you've been going to PT for months on end and you're not seeing any changes, then they're probably it's either not amenable to, to rehab or they're doing the wrong thing. So or you're taking medications that aren't working, stop. Thank you very much. So I'm hearing don't give up, keep being your own best advocate, look for information, connect with the Vestibular Disorders Association to find your providers in your area through our provider directory and know that we are here for you and we need and appreciate your continued support. Thank you to our expert panel. Um, again, very much, it's been my pleasure and my privilege to host all of you today. I hope you'll come back and um, do this again. And everyone listening, thank you for your support to Vita and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.